Thank you for tuning in to another edition of the Business of Fun Podcast. It is me, your host, Dave Wakeman. My guest today is Paul Williamson from Two Circles, which is a consultancy with offices in New York, London, and around the world. Uh, Paul is a great guest because um, Paul has... Let me let me pump myself up first. Paul called the Talking Tickets newsletter the greatest newsletter uh, or the best newsletter uh, anywhere in tickets in the world. So get that, talkingtickets.substack.com. Uh, all kidding aside, Paul is uh, really has a great story to tell. Uh, he has experience working with uh, big-time events like the Olympics, uh, the World Cup Euros, um, a lot of huge sporting events. And recently we had a chance to catch up because we didn't get a chance to catch up in Birmingham. And I, Paul shared an idea with me that I was really curious to explore a little bit more on the podcast about how every event that he starts in basically shares similarities with a startup. So really, really interesting idea. Uh, but before I tell you a little more about Paul, uh, I want to remind you to get the Talking Tickets newsletter. You can get it at talkingtickets.substack.com. Uh, make sure you check out my website, davewakeman.com. Uh, catch up with my friends at Booking Protect. We are working on uh, several new podcast guests. We have a whole... Um, we're going to try a little... Um, like kick off with questions. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what form it is, but check out the folks at Booking Protect. That's bookingprotect.com. Uh, as we have discussed here many, many times before, uh, refund protection has taken on incredibly um, more importance to consumers since lockdowns from the pandemic have started to lessen and ease and then gone away almost everywhere in the world. And what we've seen through the data is that people are taking up refund protection at rates that can be double what they were taking up refund protection at before the pandemic began. So that highlights the fact that customers really are looking for that sense of uh, peace of mind, uh, that sense of security, um, all of these things that will... They're looking for security around the pro the payment process. You know, they're looking for all of these things to just help make the decision to go to sports or theater or in a live event safer to them, right? That's what that data means. So check them out at bookingprotect.com. Talk to uh, Haley, Simon, Kat, Kath, any other team. They're all fantastic. Um, the one unfortunate thing about the pandemic is that it has shut our ability to be everywhere in the world together down, but that's okay. We're going to get back to that soon too. Uh, so check them out, bookingprotect.com. So back to Paul Williamson. So Paul and I, uh, we spent a really nice time talking about market research and the customer. One of the things that we uh, really got into was how important it is to understand your market. Uh, I don't, know if we got to the actual money quote of you are not your customer, but if not, I say that regularly and you are not your customer. You need to understand what the customer wants, what the market wants so that you can make better decisions, right? As soon as you start putting your beliefs on the customer, you get yourself in trouble. We talk about what it's like to start an event from nothing, right? Which is what many of Paul's events have been like. We talk about some of his experiences with the London Olympics and how they use price as a marketing tool, right? We've talked about how you can use price to tell the story. We talk about different ways to reach different customers. We talk about balancing profits and attendance. We talk about just all kinds of stuff around sports and events. And we really did it through a lens of what will work for you now or what you can apply now that things have reopened and you might be in need of new ideas. So this is a really good conversation with Paul Williamson. Um, I'll be curious to see what you think, because I thought it was uh, really, really one of the best ones that we've had in a while. All right, perfect. I am happy and excited to welcome Paul Williamson to the Business of Fun podcast. Paul, uh, how are you? Um, I must say, before I say that, that la before, since the last time we talked, the top four race has gotten much tighter between my t my team, your team, and your son's team. It's gotten a lot a lot more interesting, I think. But how are you today? 
I'm 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 very well. I'm over in London, um, where it's a bit cold today, uh, but we are certainly um, in the middle of the soccer season, and we're gearing up for lots more sport this summer. And um, yeah, there's 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 certainly lots going on. Unfortunately, my team, Manchester United, are are truly inept right now, um, and are, are are limping along in sixth place. But um, but the other teams around them are certainly. Uh, making it going to be a, a tight end of season race, which is ultimately what we want in live sport. What you want is you don't know the outcome when you go to the game. Yeah, no, it, it is. Uh, I would say uh, as a Spurs fan, it has been a tale of two seasons, but it has been um, interesting, you know, and, and Conte makes it even more so. Uh, so and I, then I found out your son was an Arsenal fan, and I was like, well, but we were we were we were having such a nice conversation until then. <laughs> well, I, I, I saw probably poss- no probably Man United's best result of the season when we won three nil at Spurs, um, and that was back in whew, October, I think. Yeah. Um, Ronaldo got the first, um, and you know, Spurs were made to look mediocre now it's the other way around and you know Manchester United you know can't 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 get their act together right well that was the, they called it the Conte Bowl because whichever team lost was definitely going to fire their manager and we won by losing so it was great we got rid of Nuno Nuno and we got Conte so we we won by losing I, I remember and, that one very vividly and that kept Solskjaer <laughs> in a job for another three weeks yep I, I do think in the end, uh, and obviously this is not a football podcast, but that's okay. We talk about what we want to because it's my podcast. Uh, I think United got it right, though, by ha- hiring Eric Ten Hag. And I would say, um, despite my Spurs allegiance, you know, it's more exciting when Man United is doing well. And they are uh, exciting because they just elevate the entire league because they're so big and so popular. And, and, and look, I agree. It's going to take some hard work for him to to sort it out. But um, I was intrigued with stuff I was reading online this morning about um, the NFL draft and how yeah. it's it's finally made it to Vegas after several years of trying. Um, yeah. And you know, and that that's a big deal. And and you know, um, was it the was it the Bengals who lost the Super Bowl this year? Correct. Yes. And two years ago, they had the first draft pick because they were bottom. Yep, that's right. And, and you know, in in European sport, you don't get turnarounds like that. Right. Um, mm-hmm. The bottom does not go top in two years in in, in, in European sport. Um, we don't have a, a, a draft to to equalize things. Um, yes, it's very, very competitive in 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 english soccer but it's very competitive between four five six teams yeah in spain it's very competitive between two or three teams in germany it's competitive between one team um and and we don't have that (laughs) that that same structuralist element to sport yeah it's um and then there, there would also be a political and economic joke in there too is that like the NFL wants to be the most capitalist league in the world, but they love their socialism. Uh, because, but that's that's a different that's a different podcast. If I start a podcast uh, a politics podcast, we can talk about that one. Um, but what I but thank you for doing this because it's um it's really great to have you on because we we had a, fi- a chance to finally talk to each other a couple of weeks ago, um, and I was like, oh man, if you come on and do the podcast, it would be amazing because I think you have like some really great stories and some really great examples of your work that. I think people would learn from, especially in light of the state of recovery that we're in right now. Um, And one thing you brought up when we were talking about two weeks ago was you talked about how every project you start on is akin to a, or every project you start is akin to being a part of a startup. And we talked about, you know, you need to understand your market. You have to do your research. You have to build a customer profile so you understand what everything looks like. Um, And you walk through all these steps of being a startup. I find that that seems to be relevant to everybody now, but people don't always understand it. So can you explain this idea of every project you get into as a startup to us? Um, Because I think it would be helpful Um, for people. My my background has has been working in in sports ticketing for for far too long, several decades. Um, And 
uh, a decade ago, I was the director of ticketing at the London 2012 Olympic Games, um, which was the biggest startup of them all. I mean, literally, it was a blank sheet of paper in, in 2007, 2008. And when we closed the business after the Olympic Games in 2012, we'd done a billion dollars in ticketing um, just on the Olympic and the Paralympic Games. Um, and that was from a, a, a zero uh, revenue start point. Um, and since then, I, I decided I quite enjoyed doing that and I was pretty good at it. So I, I stuck around, worked on my own, but kept getting hired by big sports events, Rugby World Cups, Cricket World Cups, World Athletics Championships, World Hockey Cups, across the globe and, and advising them in different ways. Um, and and now I work in a in a bigger company, Two Circles, who bought out my company uh, last year. And and through Two Circles, we're working in even more startups, like you know the next Ryder Cup in golf, for example. Um, and what I found I enjoy is that it's not the continuity of of week to week of team sports. It's it's about working out how on earth we make this thing fly. Um, but with the excitement of the blank sheet of paper so that we can determine how it flies and we can we can we can shape it. And, and I think that starts with a, a vision of what's the outcome we want and an understanding of who are who are the customers who we want to take on that journey. We want to engage with and we want them to buy our tickets. And, and bringing those two things together, Dave, is, is kind of the excitement of working in, in sports startups for, for big, strange sports events. Big, strange sports events. I like that term. So you start out with the outcome that we want, and then you focus on the customers. And you and I think we both agree that there's not necessarily always enough attention paid to the customer. Uh, how have you settled on, you know, First, beginning with the outcome we want, because I think that a lot of times it seems that people ha already have. It's not so much that the, the that they are investigating the outcome, it's that they've already like set themselves up an outcome that they need to achieve without ever having done any sort form of research or understanding anything around the market. So when you're talking about starting from the point of the outcome we want, you know what does that look like? You know, and how do you decide upon that? You're, 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 unfortunately, you're quite right. Um, <laughs> most often in, 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 in sports events, but also in, in team sports, people have determined what the minimum revenue that can be achieved must be. And therefore, you have to reverse engineer to get to that minimum revenue level. Um, and I get part of that because you've got to cover costs. But that's never a good start point of saying, hey, I've got to do 300 million US dollars or 500 million US dollars if no one has even thought about what the product is and who the customers are. So there's always that reverse engineering, but there's always as well the, 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 the triangle of maximizing revenue, maximizing occupancy, because you want the event to look great on TV. You want it to look noisy, exciting the place to be. And a good sports event, engages TV viewers because they want to be there. They want to be part of it. Um, and, the, and the third axis is, is, is accessibility. You want people to be able to afford to come. You want young people. You want families. You want a range of customers, not just people with, with deep pockets and big wallets. And, and it's blending those together, which is the, which is the, the fun bit, the, the, the skill bit, if you like, to try and create a strategy to, to to build a business from from zero. And let me ask you this, because the triangle that's that's a really good analogy, and I found that like analogies help people understand things. Uh, and I I can now see this like much clearer. How do you go about like what's the conversation like to to manage this triangle? Because one thing that I see people pay well, I see all three of these things is something people pay. Uh, lip service too, but don't always follow through upon. But accessibility um, and making sure that there's a room to bring in new audiences or develop new customers or develop get fans involved in a way that they haven't been before seems to be a 
maybe the most popular one of these ideas to get paid with lip service with the least amount of attention. How do you have this conversation to balance these things in the right way? Because I, I mean, I'm really curious about this because when you said the startup thing and starting from zero in the blank paper, I'm always amazed by this because it, you know, it, 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 it's, it's very similar to what I do. And, and I found it's a very useful analogy when you're talking to key directors or you're talking to a board at a at, at a major sports event who've never really done it before and certainly don't understand ticketing and know there's a lot of revenues that they need to, to drive. But everyone now gets the concept of the startup. 15 years ago, it wasn't a sexy term, but now it is. And people understand startup because they know there's some disciplines in it. You mm -hmm. want good people to do smart things. You want to understand your customer. You want to plan your route to market and your sales strategy. And by by putting it under a, a, a bubble, if you like, of, of, of startup, it enables you. It enables me, I find, to to businessize ticketing. And too often ticketing is sat in the corner and taken for granted when in fact it's a it's the, it's the lifeblood of most sports because as we saw during lockdown live sport played in front of a, a an empty stand is is just not the same absolutely and, and so this idea of business sizing tickets i'm interested in this because i, I often find that I don't want to say that ticket people, I guess their business skills are, are not necessarily always appreciated. Like you said, they're over in the corner somewhere. Um, when we're talking to people about like, you know, because I have the same conversation with marketers and I'm like going, stop running from what you're good at, right? Stop running from like the power you have in the organization. Because to me, you know, the same way tickets, like an event without any fans and it sucks, uh, without marketing your business, you don't have much of a business. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you talk to your teams about, you know, taking the, the power of the ticket and using it so that they are involved in these important conversations around accessibility, around revenue, or, you know, around attendance, all of these things? Because I think most of the time the ticket people get dismissed. I mean, you, you said it. They're in the corner. No, ex ex Why am I even shut, shortcutting this? Ex exactly. And I, I battle hard to, to get ticketing, you know, up front and central because – um the, the the other point is is very often with with ticketing major events um the the organization says or or the ticketing people say yeah um but but historically they, they've always been like late buyers in this market they never buy until a week out mm -hmm. they never buy until during the event and i think that's nonsense uh, and that's lazy um because if ticketing can deliver certainty with six months to go, nine months to go, not that all the revenues are in, but that the, the revenues are going to be achieved and the seats are, are going to be full, that has such a knock-on impact for everyone else's planning around food and beverage, around security, around transportation, around match day experience, um, around... Um, TV camera angles, you know, whatever. And if, if ticketing can deliver some of that certainty, the ripples through the rest of the organization are really, really strong. Um, and you save money as well, because people can plan things earlier, buy things earlier, rather than spend it late and, and spend more. And and that's what I've always that that's always enabled me to get a, a better seat at the table, if you like, is by saying, hey. If we get this right with our plan, you guys all benefit. No, that I mean, it makes sense to me. And it, it, what it strikes me and what's interesting to me, or, or maybe not interesting, but confusing actually to me is how many of these, um, you know, you called it lazy thinking, you know, everybody's a late buyer, customers don't do this, they don't do that, right? Like any of these justifications they have for decision making that is not based in fact, and it's not based in data, it's not based in knowing the market, it's, it's based in really sticking your finger in the air and waving it around and going, ah, this, this makes sense to me, um, is that it under 
So it dismisses the importance of sales and marketing and ticketing uh, and the success of any of it, right? And and this is really true in any business that I've worked with, not even ones that are in t- involved with tickets. Um, you know, and then as soon as like you, you aren't hitting your numbers, as soon as like things start to look bad, like you're saying like, well, the food and beverage department can't necessarily figure out and make plans. Uh, you know, TV is having a problem because the attendance looks light. All these things come into play. Let me call in the ticketing team and the sales and marketing team right away because they need to work their miracle magic. I, I just I, I'm curious, like how, you know, as things are recovering, right, because now this this is part of the recovery phase of, of what we've been dealing with with the pandemic. How can we get people to reset? Like, how can we teach people? to reset these conversations because we've seen even in the early stages that while, you know, in the UK soccer tickets are selling well, football tickets sell well, but tickets in theater, regional theater struggling. Uh, Some of the West end shows are are struggling. Uh, Broadway ticket sales have been down. Sports across America are having trouble. Um, You know, how do we reframe the, how do we teach people to reframe the conversation correctly? And how do we teach people to do, what you've done or what I do, where it's just like going, let me talk to you about the privacy of getting early ticket sales, of putting the incentives in place to get people to commit early, of marketing and selling in a way that makes it seem like it's a mistake not to buy my ticket early because I don't want to miss out on this. You know, how do we teach that? And and and, and I don't think there's any easy answer. I don't think there's any silver bullet to that. Um, but but that goes back to. Um, you know, startups and business disciplines, because far, far too often, as we've seen in the last six months, as as sports come back to life post post COVID, they're just trying to to do what they did before and do it faster um, and do it with more disinfectant sprayed around the building, and and they haven't really changed any of their attitude or understood whether customers want something different. Um, and I don't, and I don't think any of us know the answers to, you know, what what will the reset look like in eighteen months' time when we're back to a new normal. Um, but 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 right now, I, I I do think it's all about trying to get customers back to re-experience, re-engage with that joy, that fun of live, and whether that's live sport or live theatre or live music live was what we missed as human beings and as a society for 18 months and i don't think sports are trying hard enough to sell the sizzle to sell the live to sell the the excitement of 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 of, of being in a in a seat alongside people who are screaming and shouting like you are um and and i think too often sports defaults to selling the great sports stars who are doing amazing things with a basketball or a football, rather than this is a day out for you with your family, with your friends, to experience that feeling you get, Dave, as you walk up Tottenham High Road an hour before kickoff, and the hairs on the back of your neck are starting to stand up because you're really looking forward to this, but you're tense as well because you're nervous. And, And that experience is difficult to bottle and sell but that's what it's all about it's not just about the sport it's about being part of the game yeah it, it it's a simple answer to say I, I know it's about incentives right there have never there the incentives haven't been in place for people to have to market and sell based on the experience and I try as i might to explain to people, you know, the, the the importance of taking a customer focus over what is happening now, which is a sales or advertising focus thing, or even a product focus, um, it's it's still a struggle. But you're abs- you're absolutely right because I still think about the time I went to Wembley to see Spurs and Chelsea, and of course the game was great because Spurs won, but like it was the whole it's the whole thing, and I I, I try to. Um, And and I'll be curious how you approach this, because what's missed is that these are all once in a lifetime experiences, because you're never going to see the same people in the same place at the same time doing the same things ever again. You're never going to be in the same stadium filled with the same 40, 50, 60,000 fans ever again. You know, for a lot of people, it's their first experience. So you're never going to be you're never going to have that again. Right. These are all once in a lifetime things that are powerful. 
they're meaningful and they have the ability to make it seem just like uh not just like a want to but like mandatory that you're a part of this right and you know and i, I think that is to me at least it's just missed so often that this these are once in a lifetime things no okay. matter what it is and okay okay dave here's a couple of examples okay um I think it's it's difficult for sports marketing to always get across that excitement and those those game changing natures. But there are things you can do. And um, one of the things that that I've always indulged in, if you like, and I'm you know known for it over here in London, is is using price itself as a marketing tool. Okay. So at the London 2012 Olympics. Um, every single sport all 26 of them the 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 lowest adult entry price was 20 pounds for a ticket and and you could go to any any sport for 20 pounds for some sessions on some days so you could see usain bolt running the 100 meters albeit in the preliminaries for for 20 pounds okay so that was a value proposition which didn't exclude many people and certainly made it feel accessible okay but then what we did was say, OK, at 220 sessions of the Olympic Games, maybe 40 percent of them, we're going to have child prices. We want to welcome families. We want you to bring your kids and we want you to focus on these sessions because um, bringing kids is a good thing for the Olympics. So we introduced pay your age. So if you're age five, you paid five pounds to come to the Olympic Games. If you're age 12, you paid 12 pounds. If you're age 15, you paid 15 pounds all the way up to 16. And then we introduced as well. If you were over 60, you paid 16 pounds and felt young again. And what this did was change the conversation. So pay your age made it interesting inclusive accessible fun um and talked about at zero marketing cost so instead of having a 10 pound ticket for children we averaged that out between two pounds and 16 pounds and had pay your age and people said hang on what happens if a bloke turns up with a balding head and a beard and pretends he's age 12 and we said well We'll trust you that you don't do that. And they said, oh, wow, thank you. And actually, it didn't really happen. Yeah. So we, 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 we changed the game there attitudinally about how we were going to sell the games, sell the Olympics, just by using price as a tool itself. Obviously, you're pandering to me with the price conversation here, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, so how did you sell that internally? How do you sell that to people? Because that's one of the biggest challenges I face is getting people to think about pricing as a tool that can tell the tell a different story that can improve um, your marketing. It's funny. Um, I, I, I came up with it. It came out of something else, but it was an idea. Um, and the woman who used to sit next to me, Louise, who was my my first hire, brilliant woman. She did all the, the sales and marketing. I told her this 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 aim early in her early in her career and she, she looked me in the eye and said paul they'll never let you do that i said okay let's see how far we can run before someone says no so we just kept running with it and engaging with it and i sat down with paul dighton our chief exec who was the smartest guy i've ever worked for explained it to him and he said paul that's brilliant that's so olympic Let's just do it. And he saw that and backed me up and we told the IOC what we were doing and we explained it to the board. And, you know, some people were worried about giving away too much cash to kids and all the rest of it. And I said, no, 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 we will end up with 15 percent of tickets being sold to children because it's always 15 percent no matter where I go. OK. And it was about engaging internally with people to see the bigger picture rather than the narrow dollar return on every event. And so you, you say it was about looking at the big picture. 
And that brings us to the, uh, the conversation around strategy versus tactics. I did some research, um, gosh, it's probably been 18 months ago now, a little, you know, probably about 18 months now. And I found that like almost half businesses have no strategy that they, to speak of, right? And here you are at, as, you know, you talked about going through this process with the Olympics and teaching people how to see the big picture over the small picture. Um, I know that in live sports and entertainment strategy is woefully um, probably way less than 50%, rep, you know, that people have less, you know, less than 50% organization have a real strategy. How do you help people understand, A, the importance of strategy, and then B, how to think through it in a way that's like as simple as you just explained it around pricing, you know, like, how do you do that? Because I'm, I'm putting, I'm, I'm projecting on you the idea that I think you're a really good teacher of this, this stuff. I wish. I'm pandering um, to you now. I think <laughs> I, I, I think I, on, on, on the one hand, I take it back to business. Hey, guys, if we're building a business that's going to turn over 100 million US dollars or 500 million US dollars in the next 18 months, we need a serious strategic plan which reduces that risk, mitigates that risk and enables us to run fast. So let's write that strategic plan. Let's debate that strategic plan. Then leave me to get on with executing it. OK, let's debate it at a high level and then we can sort out the detail because we've got a good ticketing team here who know what they're doing. But let's engage at an executive management level and then a board level on the big picture, because if they're not on board with you, there's no point. You need, you need to take them with you. Um, and, you know, for me, price was a long way down that that strategic plan. But high up in that strategic plan was fill the seats, hit the revenues, engage the nation, make it affordable. And once you've got people on board with those as strategic plans, along with a timeline which says we're going to come to market here because that enables us to springboard off this and carry forward into that, people could understand the construct. And, and once you start building that framework, filling that out with interesting stuff is much easier than, than if you're trying to sell a, a dangerous concept right at the start. And I think too often people don't focus on building that strong business framework, getting a consensus around that, which actually gives you much more freedom to do what you want in the day to day job because you've got the air cover from the strategic plan. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And then I also the I, you've come back to it several times is the need to have a strong business sense and a strong business background. Because one of the, it's almost, um, I guess it would be a verbal tick of mine at this point now, is like, there's all these sports management programs in the States. And I go, instead of being a good sports business person, be a good business person. And if you, you can apply that to sports, if you are just a sports business person, you might not necessarily be able to apply that outside of your this area. And you may not be applying the right things because you may not have learned them. Uh, hey, and if, if, if you look around, Dave, you know, you, you can count. In, in some sectors of the sports business, there are lots and lots of very smart people running very fast and very competitively in TV rights sales, in sponsorship sales for shirts or for venue naming. But in ticketing, business is taken less seriously. Pe people don't look for business experience, business insight and business planning in the same way as they do in those other sectors of the sports industry. I don't know why that is, because they should be looking even more, because fundamentally we're a cash business where mm -hmm. in ticketing you can make an influence by turning the dial because you can influence next week's sales and the week after sales in a much more deliberate way than perhaps you can with TV rights, which are sold across a five year period. Right. It it also goes back to you talked about at the start with the absence of fans during the pandemic, you know, and they're in the lockdowns. 
uh, people have taken the TV rights for granted as well. And I go, hey, look, if there are no fans in the stands, you know, generating excitement, pretty soon that'll detract from the ratings. And we saw that almost immediately because people just didn't seem to be as engaged with the with the view, you know, with the TV broadcast because it, they were kind of anodyne, kind of like life was soulless. Um, you can't take any of this stuff for for granted. And oh. exactly. And what, one of the interesting things I found in the last six months, the the, the company I work for now, Two Circles, it, its start point is is customer data, and mm-hmm. it's using customer data, fan data, to understand better who those customers are, what they want, how they interact with that with that sports organization and and how they can be engaged with to to grow either their their revenue spend or their the number of times they attend or or both um, and how other lookalike fans can be can be recruited and it's a relatively new science in sport is starting with data and working upwards and using that for research and insight in order to 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 drive the business, you know, in the states we're now working with the NFL, we're working with Learfield, we're working with some of the um, the big sports clubs. Um, in Europe, it's it's a bit more um, endemic, and we work with FIFA and UEFA and Wimbledon and Ryder Cup and people. Um, but but all of them are are taking a a longer term, a medium to long term view on. Now I'm capturing this data. What should I be doing with it? What could I be doing with it? How does it cross over into digital, into social, to engage with people and make them stronger fans? Mm-hmm. I found that, uh, I guess, I want to say maybe it was, uh, again, 18, 24 months ago, the NFL did one of the greatest um, market research studies I've ever seen done in sports. And what it did was they came up with insights that found that if you don't engage a kid, and that they're not in, in, like involved and engaged with the NFL by the time they're 18, your ability to make them a fan uh, decreases like some ridiculous amount. Like it becomes three or four times as hard to get them to become a fan. And that was what led them to uh, those Nickelodeon games that they brought that they've started to broadcast here is that we they knew they needed to get the kids involved earlier. And that's directly out of using data. And this is the question I want to ask you, because you're talking about it being a new science, a new um way of dealing with things because i'm curious about this does it start with a question right does the does the research start with like you asking a question or does it just start with uh you know digging for insights because when i teach people i teach them to start looking for insights start digging through their data start using their data based upon a question that they're looking to answer an assumption they've made a hypothesis they've developed and i'm curious how you approach it um both for ongoing clients, it's exactly what you highlighted, Dave. It, it's about digging into that data, finding insights, trying to understand, find correlations, and then to multiply those up into propositions and, and to change the the, 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 the the business going forward. In my world of, of startups, you're often starting with zero data. So you need to both recruit fans and do independent research as well to understand who are the right fans to be targeting to recruit. Um, Because you don't often, at at a World Cup or Olympic Games, you don't often inherit any relevant data. You've got to go out and start building that fan club. So depending upon the the type of sport, it's, it's both. And if you look at if you look at FIFA, you know, they've been sat on loads of fan data for, for a long time through through ticketing and TV and, and international soccer matches. And, and now they've launched FIFA Plus in the last couple of weeks. And we've been you know involved in that, it, which is which is a real sort of step forward in terms of fan engagement in a digital world in the run up to the Soccer World Cup later this year. And. And, and that's exactly, I think, learning off the off the NFL route about engage people in that crucial age between sort of 12 and, and 20. And you've got them for life. Yeah. And I question I question whether baseball does any of that. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll plead the fifth on that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can talk about that when we're not recording. Um, that's uh that's a that's a story for a different day um 
Yeah, no, I, I, I think about it too, because it's very, it's very important no matter where you're going, there is that crucial window, right? Because we were talking about how you're a huge Rolling Stones fan and how many Rolling Stones concerts you've gone to. And I'm guaranteeing that now that you've pointed it out, your love of the Rolling Stones started between the age of 12 and 20. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was telling you about how I like at some point, more likely than not, I'll be in London for the Pearl Jam shows at Hyde Park. And I can point to exactly I was 17 years old the first time I heard Pearl Jam. So, I mean, you know, it, that window is key. And what is confusing to me is why people don't pay more attention to that window, because that window is that's that's key to lifetime customer value, lifetime fan well, value, if you want to do and, it. And- and, and look at it, you know, I've no idea why you became a Spurs fan, but there was probably a reason a number of years <laughs> ago, but and it was probably completely idiosyncratic and random. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. But that decision has will have a lifetime benefit to Spurs of mm-hmm. many thousands of dollars o- yeah. over that over your lifetime if they manage that interaction with you sensibly. And they do manage. They are a very good example of how to manage that relationship well. Um, I would say if I had I, these are the two that I am closest to as far as like being aware of what they do. City and Spurs do it exceptionally well because my son's birthday was last week and he got a card from Human Son, right? And you know it's an auto generated thing, but he thought he he doesn't care about the cards from his aunts or uncles or like mom and dad. He's like he got a card from Son. And, you know, I know it's like, you know, auto printed and the whole thing, but he still thinks it's like the greatest thing in the world. And um, just managing that is not that hard. I mean, the technology is there to manage these things pretty effectively. Now it's ridiculous not to. And, you know, it's it's just a missed opportunity. And, 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 And in doing that, they could they could take him on an 80 year fan journey. Mm-hmm. worth hundreds of dollars each year because no matter what happens from now on he might drift away from spurs at various points in his life mm-hmm. but he's never ever going to support arsenal correct yes and the research is pretty clear on this too it's like the um the strength of the relationship will will call you know will grow or or, or shrink from time to time but the uh loyalty itself never really never truly goes away because like even if you are largely detached you're still attached to your team you you know and and that should just be factored in right it's not like you have to recreate a new fan you just need to manage the relationship in a way that says hey look we're here for you when you want when when you need us again you know we're you know we don't ever walk away from us yeah. And um, my son will always be a Spurs fan. There's and, no doubt. When, 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 when I'm building a startup, I can't use all those techniques because I'm not building a lifetime relationship. But what I'm trying to do is build a fun and exciting live relationship, which takes yeah. them to a great live event yeah. and deepens their love for that sport yeah. or for, in the case of the Olympics, the five rings. And and that's that's really important because using ticketing to help people on an emotional journey is is a real part of the business, uh, Dave. It, it it really is. And where where ticketing is merely a transaction, it's it's failing. It, well, it's a, to me, it's always been a door, you know, into something that you love or something you don't even love. Because I still very specifically. Uh, remember the first Broadway show I was ever at and I you know and I didn't grow up around the theater and around arts but I was like oh my god this is amazing you're like in the same room with like these huge stars like it was you know like the first show I saw was Cat on the Hot Tin Roof and it had uh, Ashley Judd and I forget who the actor was and it was a horrible production of it but it was just like it was magic and I was always attached to it. I remember being a kid, seeing the first time I went to a baseball game and the grass and the whole thing. And it was magic. And that magic, you know, it's, it's a sure it's a transaction and we have to make the transaction to keep the thing going, but you you're losing out if you don't focus on the magic and in your role of doing startups, 
it doesn't have to be a specific athlete or a specific event. It's like you said, the five rings, it could just be the experience of, you know, of being around people and sharing in like London um, patriotism, right around like the, the ability to bring the but, but Olympics to London. But there's, there's also exotic, exoticism, if that's a word. You know, yeah, I did, that's poetic I did, justice. Poetic I, did, I did Rugby World Cup in Japan in 2019, and rugby is, you know, maybe the fifth best ranked sport in Japan. And we focused entirely on World Cup that happens to be rugby. And it's <laughs> once in a lifetime and it's coming through Japan. And it's live and it's big. And you've just got to be there because you're never going to see it again. And right. using a very different proposition in a different marketplace resonated with those potential customers. They became customers. And that went back to understanding that the, the position of that sport in that society, doing some research, peeling back what Japanese fans like, which is different to European fans, and then putting that in the ticket marketing and in the communications to drive them into the event. And ultimately they came to a live event, loved it, and hopefully stick around and watch some more rugby now. Yeah, no, it, 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 it's really amazing too. If you, if you take, if you have the willingness to take a step back, right. When you do the research, cause I, I describe research as like, the willingness to take your ego out of the out of the situation and being willing to step back and look at the world through someone else's eyes, you you will see that like in the case of rugby and Japanese people, right? I, J Japan's great, but they're not like people that are they love rugby. Uh, that's not something that they would say. Oh, it's great. They would be like baseball. If you had the baseball, like the World Baseball, um, whatever that World WC the World Series, they would go crazy for that. But Japanese people love events. They love to get together. They love social atmospheres. They love celebrating like community and things like this. That's all stuff that you can definitely sell on. That's like truly powerful. And, um, you, you know, I want to ask about this research thing just a touch more um, because I find it interesting in the way that you seem to talk about it. Really, I've learned a lot so far. So is it a big ask? you know, to get people involved in taking this approach to the research, because the, I guess the way I want to frame it is everybody talks about data and they talk about how much data they have, but the insights are struck. People are struggling with insights. And yet your whole process is built around digging and developing insights and, you know, taking the idea that I don't necessarily have the answer at the start, but I know how to find it. You know, is that a hard sell or is, I, th I think I think that's that's the interesting piece, and that's the piece I enjoy because it's it's taking that research, understanding that research, but then having the experience to take the leap of faith off there to say, yeah, you may say that the most expensive ticket you would pay to watch athletics at the London Olympics is fifty pounds, and that's if Usain Bolt is running. But, but in 2008, you don't understand the excitement of live and the five rings and the Olympics. And actually, we're going to take that price much higher because we can see that the latent demand behind that for athletics is really strong. And, and we pushed that top price to £700, $900, OK? And people paid it, some. Um, but we did that because through building our fan club, we asked everyone, what are your five favorite sports? And then we just had a, a straightforward ranking of where the interest was across all the sports. And that gave us a, a different dimension into research against what people thought of price of, of what was their propensity to be interested in it. And sometimes you've just got to triangulate things to try and find a, a solution. Well, and I think the other thing too is like if if you ask this price question, this is why you have to do pricing research, which you should be doing pricing research from the sounds of what you're telling me, which again uh, is something I preach all the time. Is if you depending on how you ask the question, you might or might not get a useful answer. But B, if you just take one person's pricing answer as the go the gospel truth you're often wrong. You need to do massive quantitative data research around pricing because 
one or two people or 10 people, they're not going to give you a very effective answer. They only can help you with a hypothesis. Like, oh, 50, Paul says he's only going to pay 50 bucks for a ticket to see Usain Bolt. Let me see what the rest of the people say. I think the, 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 the other thing is, is now compared with 15 years ago, um, research is so easy because people oh, yeah. have data and access to data. And that access to data is almost free in most sports clubs, you know, w ecosystems. And why more research isn't done more often? I don't understand, Dave, because we've all got databases. We've all got um, people who, you know, your son would love to get a piece of research about um, where does he like sitting in Tottenham Stadium? Who's his favourite player? What's his birthday? Um, and uh, how much would his dad pay to take him to the match? <laughs> yeah, no. exactly. And he would fill that in happily every evening, you know. Yeah, it, it's it's so true. And they also one piece of uh, research that people don't use nearly enough that I say, like, here, here, if you are struggling with your research, start with my good friend Google, because there's like secondary data. There's all these studies, all this research that other people have done that you can just go, well, what am I looking for? And you can put it into the Google machine. And most of the time, Google will spit out something you, better than you could do yourself. And somebody's already done it. They've already like broken down the data. They've already put it in fancy charts. They've done all this great stuff for you. And all you have to do is go read it and analyze it and figure out what it means. And and, and, and that reminds me, and you know, one, one of the things we did with the Olympics, and I, I've learned to do ever since, is distill down that whole pricing strategy into two or three KPIs. So mm -hmm. for the London 2012, we we explained it, explained the ticketing process as we've got two million tickets that cost 20 pounds or less. Two thirds of our tickets will cost less than 50 pounds and 90% of our tickets cost less than 100 pounds. And my chairman, Sebastian Coe would roll out those KPIs whenever he was talking to say, hey, yeah, some of the top prices are really high. This is the best sports event in the world. But look yeah. at our value proposition and our value proposition, our foundations are really strong. And, it, and if you can produce some KPIs around your business model, your business plan for ticketing, it, it gives you a, a, a real engagement point with customers because they see that in other parts of society and they can relate to it. Yeah. And I believe that, and, and you tell me if I'm wrong, that is another thing that really, really has been done poorly in sports lately. It's like understanding, you know, having KPIs, being able to tell a story that makes sense to an average customer or fan. And, and you know, and really like, actually being able to back it up with stuff that's not complete and utter BS. Uh, I, 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 absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I stuffed you. <laughs> that, and that, that focuses the mind at, at a business level in a, in a sports yeah. organization, because if you come at it through research, do some good insight, determine your pricing plan, and then are able to map that into something coherent in two or three sentences, Hey, that's a strategic business plan yeah. for ticket yeah. pricing. You've done it, you know, and it wasn't difficult. It was two or three steps. But suddenly it's it has some academic rigor and some business foundations. Yeah. This it, it is really great because, you know, you talked about the two or three sentences and that's a strategic plan. I go really honestly, when I teach, when I do these workshops, I go, if we our, if we have to go to a second page of our strategic plan, then we've screwed up. It should really be a, a series of bullet points. And I'm going to say five is like too many in most cases, right? You should, everybody should know what it is and be able to repeat it over and over and over again. Now, the tactical implications of that are going to be a little bit more complex, but the strategy itself should be four or five bullet points at the most. And it should tell you exactly like what the goal and the ambition is, where we're focusing, why people are picking us over someone else. And that's really it. And and you should be able to explain it. I should be able to wake Paul up in the middle of the night and go, Paul, what's the, st the strategic vision of the, uh, what are you you're working on? The, the women's euros right now. Is that right? 
or yeah, the, 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 the women, the women's Euros, uh, World Athletics Championships in, in yeah. Oregon, USA, various other things. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, so I, I was just using that because I should be able to pop you in the middle of the night and go, what's your favorite stone song and what's the strategy there? And you should be able to go, Dave, this is it right here. Exactly. Because if it, if it can't be distilled down to something simple, then it's not going to work anyway. Correct. Be, be, because, okay, I'm not saying that a, 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 a business plan for a sports organization to sell $100 million worth of ticketing is, is simple. It's not. But the foundations and the framework are simple because the proposition has got to be simple because if it's not, the customer won't, won't engage. Yeah, because the, the, the proposition, the value proposition, the strategy or how the strategy is expressed in the language, it's not for me. It's not for Paul. Right. It's not for any of our friends and the our colleagues. It's for the customer. And if the customer doesn't understand why they should pick us, then we have no hope. You know, and if we can't make it complicated, if we make it so complicated that my son's in sixth grade now, so a sixth grader can't understand it, then we failed. And that's what I teach people or I try to teach people over and over and over again. It's like, going, make it simple enough that people can't miss the point. I always remember my late mother saying to me um, in the run up to the London Olympics, Paul, I don't care whether the sponsor is Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola, but I do want to know how I can buy a ticket to watch the high jump. Yeah. And I thought, you know, that was it, you know, and, and you know, she nailed it in one. You know, mm-hmm. she, she knows there's lots of noise around it. She just wants to understand how she can go from A to B and B being a live event that she enjoys. Yep. And we have to understand that, like, this conversation of who the sponsor is or who the partner is or all these things, they're noise to the customer, to the fan. And the fan doesn't care less. And so the thing is, is, like, we have to, uh, we have our obligations that we must fulfill. But the biggest thing is we can't let the customer down because if not, then all of that other stuff is for not. No, exactly. Exactly. Um, I'm going to have to run shortly. Yeah. Um, Well, I was going to say I'm keeping you too long. So but I I think I think I could go on forever with with you. But uh, that just gives us a chance to have another conversation. Um, How can people find you on the Internet? Um. Best way is, is actually, you know, my 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 email and through two circles, Paul dot Williamson at two circles dot com. Um, and, and, you know, that's the, the best way in terms of business to, to catch up with me. Um, otherwise, for me, LinkedIn works. Um, and, you know, I stay in touch with interesting podcasts and blogs like your own, Dave. And, uh, you know, I'm always picking up and, and seeing what people are doing there. And I'll I'll reach out randomly as well in return. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's it's very true. And I really appreciate you doing this because I had a great time talking to you. Thank you. The, the, I think the real problem is we're agreeing too much. So we need to find a topic where we'll disagree more. <laughs> we, we, I, don't worry, I'll do the research. It will definitely do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope, I, I, hey, I've enjoyed the conversation and, and thank you very much for taking the time, Dave. Let me know what you thought about my conversation with Paul Williamson. Send me an email. It is my name, Dave, at DaveWakeman.com. Check out my website, DaveWakeman.com. You'll find a uh, store, calendar, blog post, all kinds of stuff. Uh, you can sign up for all the newsletters and different things there, or you can go right to the website for Talking Tickets, which is TalkingTickets.Substack.com. Every Friday, five stories, um, action items, analysis, all kinds of great stuff. As Paul said, it's the best thing going in the world, and it's free. So sign up at talkingtickets.substack.com. Uh, make sure you check out my friends at Booking Protect, the global leaders in refund protection. As we've discussed before, uh, refund protection has taken on a, even greater importance to customers as events have gone on sale, lockdowns have lessened or ended around the world, and uh, people are trying to get back to some sort of semblance of normal. Uh, in many cases, we are seeing uh, refund protection rates taken up at rates that are double what they were before the pandemic began. Uh, that just gives me a clear indication from people's actions that they're looking for the security around their, their, their purchase, right? Be that through financial means of being able to find get some kind of refund uh, through their 
security and peace of mind that the purchase offers them. And it's just something that, you know, just gives people an overall sense of well-being, right? And remember, you're not the customer. The customer wants what the customer wants. And if they would like a little more security and peace of mind, then, you know, you'd be stupid not to because we're seeing that people just aren't necessarily always picking the things that they've picked in the past. You know, so like offering people a different purchase path could be a simple step that gets people to take action now. So check out Booking Protect and see if refund protection may be right for you and your organization or if it's something you've been thinking about. Uh, talk, Have a talk with uh, Kat, Kath, Simon, uh, Haley, uh, anyone on the team, they're all super nice. They're super great. Uh, and hopefully we will see you all at a conference again soon. Uh, as I've said now here for the better part of two years, actually, let's do this because I don't know if I'm going to get one out before the fourth anniversary of the of the uh, Business of Fun podcast. I thank you for being a listener. Uh, the podcast has um, really allowed me to travel all over the world. Uh, to make talks at conferences, to meet people, uh, to work on new projects. It's been a um, really, really great thing. And in the two or so years since the pandemic began, um, you know, I've been saying it and I still mean it. Uh, if you need to talk to somebody, um, you're feeling lonely, run down, concerned, whatever, you know, send me a, shoot me a note, David, Dave Uh I'm happy to be there for you. Um, you know, don't feel like you have to go through this whole thing alone. You know, I've been reading a really uh, incredible book called Strength to Strength, and it talks about the relationships being the most powerful thing. You know, so hit me up. Don't go through the things alone, uh, but thank you for being here. Um, there may be a fourth anniversary episode that we can go through here in the next couple of days, but if not, uh, just because uh, I'm working through these things or I forget to do the fourth anniversary, uh, thanks again for making the podcast as successful as it is. Um, thanks for listening and always paying attention. Uh, and since t- I'm dropping this on May 11th and tomorrow is the North London Derby, come on, you Spurs. Spurs. <laughs>